I think that new media is moving very swiftly in people's lives. I saw a uh, statistic the other day that really surprised me. It said that last year, 34% of people that watched a sporting event on television also had their computer or their laptop on consuming media, statistics, profiles uh, about that sport. And that really shocked me. I, I'm in the, I'd like to think I'm in the kind of meat of the, uh, the arena of new media. And I would have thought it would have been 10% and maybe three years from now, five years from now, it would be 34%. But to think that a third of the people are accessing uh, the new media while they're watching kind of the old paradigm tells you how fast this is moving. I think that uh, the acronym IPTV or Internet Protocol Television or, or maybe even interpersonal television might be a, a different way to describe it. I think it's the biggest paradigm shift in the history of broadcasting. This is bigger than black and white to color. Uh, this is bigger than standard definition to high definition. This, this changes the game. It changes it because of kind of two themes. One is that the cost to deliver content goes down so dramatically. So now we have an infinite number of channels, both the technology permits it, but also the cost. And I also think the interactivity piece. Uh, some aspects of cable and satellite allow a degree of interactivity, but nothing like IPTV. And today it's kind of the early days of responding to a survey or picking which scene you want or, you know, certain elements of it. But if you go forward, you flash forward a few years from now, the degree to which you, you interact and you participate in the content will be, will be really thought of as, as amazingly pioneering and change the way uh, we think of conventional broadcasting. I think we're at the very beginning of this whole paradigm shift in broadcasting. It's still early days. Um, I think that uh, the degree to which people interact will become part of our daily lives, almost like today we can't even think of a world where we couldn't access the internet to, to get information, or we couldn't think of having a fax machine, or we couldn't think of having a cell phone. Well, I'm old enough to remember, of course, all three of those not existing and the this notion of interacting with your content on whatever device the television uh, your laptop your mobile phone your pda whatever device it may be the, the notion of not interacting in real time uh, will be something that people say how do people get by without it and that's coming pretty quickly that is coming with smartphones it's coming with this blend of of technology and um, a desire on behalf of carriers, whether that's mobile carriers or cable carriers or satellite carriers, all trying to be on the leading edge of this theme and this wave of interest and consumers gobbling it up, just gobbling it up and loving every second of being able to do more and more things. Taking photos now with your phone seems obvious, but five years ago you didn't take a photo with your phone. Watching live video on your phone. Soon you will literally do your banking on your phone. You will vote uh, through your phone. You will do everything we've talked about. Walk by the pop machine and press a button and the pop will come out and your bank account will be deducted on the phone. That's not, you know, uh, Star Trek or Jetsons. That's right around the corner. I, I think it's tough to really delineate between really new media and, and old media because at the core of old media it was simply content. So getting your content to your television or to your computer or your laptop. So it's still the content at the core but the content becomes um, flexible. It becomes searchable in ways that it was never searchable. It becomes uh, edited and edible, if that's a word. I'm sure it's not in the way I'm trying to describe it, but that such that a consumer can edit that content in, in ways that, that the original provider of the content didn't uh, anticipate. Um, so the content still is critical. Unless you've got something that's funny or interesting or serious or newsworthy, um, you know, that, that's, it's, that's tough. Uh, but once you've got that content, the new media, so to speak, is allowing you to consume it, ingest it, share it, comment on it uh, in ways that had never been really thought of before. And that's what makes it so interesting. 
I think that's one of the user generated content is a is a fascinating outcrop of of the internet and out of technology out of being able to take a, a high definition camera that you'd buy at uh, you know your local camera store and produce a high quality video. Um, so you know the blur, particularly when you consider that some of the most popular shows on television are reality TV programs. Of course, they're professionally produced. But at the core of it, they're trying to grab basic human instincts and, and, and really play off of, of what really is user-generated content slash behavior. Uh, there's this incredible blur that's taking place. And if you look at YouTube, for example, that of course started life as a user-generated place to be. And I think Google was very prescient in buying it because they wanted to own the medium for user-generated content, but I think they also saw that there was a decent probability with what's now happening, which is that the professional content owners are getting a slice of YouTube. So, you know, there's now the, the Lionsgate channel on uh, YouTube, for example. There's the Telfazat, which is part of uh, New Lion Jump TV. We have our own channel. So we're trying to access the, the mind share and the people that gravitate towards a YouTube, but with professionally generated content. So there's absolutely a place for both, and they, they, they definitely can overlap as well. I think that today's young people, uh, you know, I have, I have kids, and, uh, you know, my 12-year-old is doing her homework, uh, watching a video, chatting through Instant Messenger all at the same time, and that's... That's unique. I don't think it's uh, ADD. I don't think it's disrespectful. I think it's how they're growing up, which is quite different from uh, my era or even maybe the previous generation to my, my kids' era. So, um, you know, the issue of comfort around whether people want to watch thing on a, uh, things on a computer or a laptop uh, are all based on where you came from. I think that, uh, let's call it the over 50 crowd definitely want to watch things on their television and I think most of us would love to settle in at a movie theater on a big screen or on a big flat screen TV at home from time to time for a movie or whatever the content is but you know I've now watched uh, episodes of Mad Men on my laptop and on a plane watching a movie and and you know what the, the quality is excellent and the experience is pretty good but that's before the whole interactivity piece of being able to do it through the internet and with computing power really overlays itself into this experience and that's what's happening day to day and then it will become clear that unless your TV's browser based, unless your TV has that real robust interactivity capability, people will much prefer to watch the content on a device that does.